Hey, I'm John Bondi and I'm here with Big John here. And we're the Grateful Anglers. This is the Grateful Anglers podcast, our second episode. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about how we individually like to catch the walleye in the river. We're not going to focus on jigging today, that's going to be down the road, but we're going to just look at a couple techniques. He has his favorites, I got my favorites, and we're just going to just, just talk walleye fishing here, maybe a little bit of ice fishing too. Sounds good. Yeah, we both love jigging, guys, but that's a whole other episode. And uh, yeah, so today we're we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, about handlining and casting. And casting in the river. That's right. <laughs> and you know, the casting is something that I haven't done yet for walleye. So I'm very I'm gonna watch this podcast myself. We're filming down here today at Bondi's Fishing Shop. Uh, yeah, we're at 3796 County Road 17. We've got your uh, ice fishing gear, got the wax worms in, minnows, everything. And speaking of ice fishing, I believe we have a, a bet to settle here. Well, you might be right, but I'm not wrong yet. <laughs> yet, okay? So I, there said are... we'd be, I said we'd be fishing here in the next few days, and it looks like guys are. Uh, we want guys to be safe when they're out there checking the ice, but we're, we're getting reports of guys being out there, so... Um, I, I think I think they're fishing the cuts and they're they're being you know, safe. They're yeah. being safe. You got to spud your way out. Nobody... And, and I'm not wrong yet, guys, because <laughs> I said the second week of January we'll be getting the boats back in. So maybe we're both going to be right. Yeah, be safe out there. We haven't heard of anybody out off Bell River or nothing crazy like that. But uh, nobody on the Thames or nothing. But uh, there is some ice fishing happening. And uh, you know, I, I looking at the long term forecast forecast, yeah, we got a little bit of a warm up, but it's gonna it's gonna cool down again, so that's good. No, but, it's uh, not. <laughs> uh, lots of guys ice fish around here. You know, uh, being in my shop, I'm shocked at the number of guys that come in here that go to Simcoe. I mean I knew Simcoe was a big ice fishing uh, place, but the amount of people that come in here that are headed there is, is crazy. It's not just around here. Yeah. But uh, it re it really is. It, it, it's like, um, it's crazy. You hear sometimes you hear more about Simcoe down here yeah. in the winter than you do about St. Clair. So, Big John, I know one thing you like to do is use a handline system. And there's a lot of people, especially people that don't live around here, even the locals really, they don't know what this is. So, why don't you go over and explain to them um, how handlining works and the, and the lures that you use. Okay, thanks, Sean. Yeah, so, uh, well, handlining isn't something I've done my whole life either, guys. Uh, I, I want to say I was maybe 19 years old when I got started. Uh, my buddy Frank Callis uh, took me out on the Detroit River in LaSalle, and it was a whole different experience. Before that day, guys, I was a jigger, and I would always see guys handlining, and, and I was kind of curious to what, what it was that they they seen in it and, and, and why they did it. Um, and the first time I did it, I knew right away, I said, I, I like this, this is a lot of fun. So yeah, anyways, um, I had my buddy Frank uh, teach me a little bit about it. And I also had uh, an old timer in LaSalle, Larry Floyd, uh, who was an amazing handliner. He, he, he did it his whole life. and. Uh, he basically taught me everything there there was to know about it, and 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 I was fortunate because he was one of the best. And when you learn from the best, uh, things go good, you know. So basically, uh, what it is is uh, this is an A and S reel. It, this is built right in Detroit, guys. Uh, and and basically, uh, what it is is just a retractable reel. So you pull out and it'll pull it right back in. What kind of line you got on there? Uh, this is just basically like coated uh, downrigger cable um, is what I call it. There is a, a pound test to it, but I couldn't tell you. I always just go see Chuck and at Strictly there and he uh, takes care of me. And you got these so, massive weights on here. Um, for people that don't live around here, live on small rivers and things like that, like. Explain why you need like a two pound weight. Okay guys, so basically what what what, what I have here is, uh, pull it tight John, uh, pull it tight, there we go. I have uh, a long leader guys, steel leader, and it's all kinked up. It was in my boat all wrapped up. I grabbed it this morning and that's why it's not in the best of shape. Uh, and then you go down to your weight, 
Um, you run anywhere from a one pound to a two pound weight. Uh, I think some guys even run two and a half pound weights, but two pound is my max. And and the golden rule of thumb with with the leader is if you're running a 20 foot lead, you wanna be 20 inches up from the weight. So 20 inches up from the weight, you'll have a clip with uh, 20 feet of monofilament line going back to your lure. What pound test it, it, are they normally using on the mono? Uh, oh, on the mono? The mono, I like running 20, uh, 25, 30. Uh, I, I usually run 25. I, I just run the big game. Um, nothing fancy, guys. Cheap line works great uh, for hand lining. Uh, some guys are running that Mason line now, and, and they swear by it, but I'm kind of old school. I just use what I have. And then, um, so yeah, guys, a lot of times I'll run two leads. I'll run a 20-foot lead off here and a 40-foot uh, lead off here. So the golden rule of thumb is if you're running a 20, you're 20 inches up from the weight, and your 40 is going to be 40 inches up from the weight. So 40 feet of line, 40 inches up from the weight. Um, and uh, as the season progresses, uh, you can run fives. Uh, I run them right off the weight with little spoons, like three, three foot or five, and you use spoons, worm harnesses, and yeah. So when it comes to baits, um, I like using the original Rapalas. Uh, earlier in the year, you start with the longer baits, like the number 13s, and then I use 11s for a while. I really like 11s, and 11s work good in dirty water too, even when uh, the water heats up a bit. Uh, if the water's dirty, you can run 11. They like that bigger profile. Big John, explain why you've got the front hook removed on some of these baits here. Well, when you're <laughs> when you're running two leads, you guys want to be uh, you you want to be under four hooks. So uh, just to be legit, I take the front hook off, and it's it's always it's always tough because I do know a lot of times fish hit that front hook, but. A lot of times when they're hitting good, they're going to hit that that center hook, and and when they're biting light, uh, you're going to get them on the tail end. So that's why I take the the, yeah. the front hook off. Now you find these plastic new age pencil uh, pencil plugs are better than the old wooden ones, you know? Well, I had some old woody, woodies, and uh, um, actually I had some that Rolly Moore made, uh, uh, another uh, local another local that 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 did a lot of fishing. <laughs> Over the years, and he, he was a great bait builder, and he, um, I, I think he passed away a couple years ago. God bless you, Rolly. Uh, but yeah, his pencil plugs work good, and and but over time, they've seen so many fish, and they just, you know, they get warped over time. Um, you know, I started using the Night Stalkers in my twenties there, and, and they just kind of held up. So uh, yeah, I, I, I always use. Those. And you know. A lot of these lures I have, guys, are like originals, man. Like I, I've had this since I was 19 years old. This clown number 11. You can see John's going to tear me apart about the the split rings and the hooks. I got. I do have to replace those. We're going to talk about fine details in another episode <laughs> for sure. But, but uh, maybe I'll bring my baits here one day. You're so good with split rings. I'll just <laughs> drop them off and. Uh, you could do some. You could do some bait maintenance for have, me. Have you found that rattling baits matter, or is it um, all just silent stuff? Yeah, I've, I've always just used silent stuff. I mean, uh, it, it would be neat to introduce a rattle. I mean, maybe it would 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 work, uh, but I've I've never had the need. Like I've just uh, basically used what what original floating rapella and uh, pencil plugs, and then as oh we're gonna lose our captain. Then later, as the season progresses, you get into the spoons. Spoons are nice, uh, especially you get a lot. You could get spoons with the single hook or the treble hooks. They both work well. Uh, and then you can get into um, crawler harnesses. And some guys use live crawlers, and and some guys run the bondy worms. Uh, show show me a bondy worm there. Yeah, you can take these bondy worms yeah. and just thread them on there. Same yep. it out in the lake trolling. Um, they both work well, guys. I mean, uh, keeps the keeps the white bass away and that, and uh, especially the bright stuff. Yeah. You know. And if it's a little slow, maybe put a half inch piece of crawler on there. But you'll catch a lot of fishes on plastic worms. A lot of guys have been doing that. But are using are using crawlers, crawler harnesses that have the float, 
You know, when guys are bottom bouncing the river, a lot of them use ones that have the little float on them. Are you using, is a float necessary or are you going on on a good clip? I generally use uh, the ones with open, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I, you know what? I've caught them on the ones with floats. I really don't think that that makes a big difference when you're trolling. Uh, I think the current's so fast and you're going against the current. Um, that's the key, guys. When you're, when you're handlining, you're going against, against current and you're tacking back and forth. You'll see guys troll straight and they're not going to have the success uh, as the guys tacking. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons to why tacking works good. Because when you're tacking, you're just crawling that bait along that ledge and just kind of hanging it in front of them there. And the other reason is when you're trolling and you tack, as soon as you tack, you change the speed of your bait when you're, and a lot of times that's when the fish will, a lot of times the fish will hit on the turn or just after when the boat strains on and it starts pulling again. And, and oh man, it's a good feeling. I can feel it right now. I can feel it right now. Hey, I, easy, I, I want to hey, gamble. I want to go. It's December. It's chill out. I know, but. Let but, me ask you this. <laughs> uh, how come that hand line works when the jigging doesn't? When it's cold and muddy and uh, like, why do you think hand lining catches them well, I in that dirty water? I think that goes back to the hang time. I call it a little bit of hang time because I think you're when you're when you're jigging, uh, it doesn't matter what the wind is, you're going at a good clip. Like your boat is, even though you're you're chasing your line, no matter which way you're chasing your line, even on a north wind, it, you're you're still you're coming down that river at a good clip. When you're hand lining, you are basically just crawling. And your your lure's still getting the same movement because you got that current that you gotta add to the speed of your trolling. So you could be trolling at like 0.9 of a mile an hour, but your bait's actually moving at two mile an hour, three mile an hour. Like it, it's got the movement, but you're just hanging it there. And I think when it, water gets dirty and you're hanging it there, those walleye have more time to zone in and more time to react and more time to hit it. But there does come a point when that water gets too dirty and it's just like, you know what? It, we're, I'm better or off too not... Clear too. I'm, I'm better off, well, too yeah. Too clear can be a problem. Too, too clear can be a problem, but yeah, nighttime. And, and then sometimes in clear water, though, you get them too uh, with the natural colors. You go to like the clown. You go to like uh, black and silver. That's a, that's a that's a great color. Let me ask you this, Big John. What do you do when you hook a muskie on that thing? You've got gloves, long pliers. Ooh, How are you prepared for that? When you he's got a say a prayer. <laughs> say a prayer. He's got your fourteen dollar rapala down in here. You, you probably should have a real long needle nose. Get that get that bait I, back. I always have long needle nose on the boat, and uh, a lot of times, I mean, my experience when I've had muskies, a lot of times they've come off or. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have it just on the end, like they haven't inhaled it. Um, but you really don't get the muskies till later on. And 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 sometimes at night, like I, I remember being over by Mud Island, uh, handlining at one o'clock in the morning by myself at a 14 foot aluminum boat. Um, and, and I hooked a muskie by Mud Island, uh, in between Mud Island and uh, Great Lakes Steel, and I'm I got this muskie on now, and I he kept trying to get into my motor, so I'm like, you know, I'm trying to work my tiller over around him. Now I got a freighter coming down. I'm like, man, so I had to I had to hold this muskie probably 20 feet behind the boat. I just kind of had to steady my line there till the freighter cleared. Then I was able to cut right around. Uh, with the with the tro trolling motor, but cut right around uh, with my tiller, and I was able to pull them in, How did and it I was able to unhook them. How did it them. taste? Oh no, you went back. I, I'm not. <laughs> I wasn't in the. But it was like one of those. Back then, I wasn't a musky fisherman, and it was kind of like, man, I'm not crazy about these things, man. You know, but it, it was one of those deals that they're not there. The they're not there all the time, uh, but. You do run the chance of getting them. Uh, yeah, they will eat small baits. No, oh, yeah, no doubt. You yeah. know, elephants eat peanuts. You know what I mean? Yeah, they'll eat a little tiny spoon like that. No problem. Well, I know that. Sometimes I'll sit out there musky fishing all day with my big baits, and these guys jigging for walleye will fish right in front of you. <laughs> yeah, but that's a whole other episode too. Uh, but yeah, anyways, that's that's what it's about. Uh, 
So, yeah, guys, I mean, uh, now we we got to talk about Johnny Boy and, and something that he's been doing for years, and that's casting the Detroit River. You know what? I'm always an inquisitive angler. I'm always looking for new ways of catching them. And, uh, you know, being a bass fisherman who's traveled a lot down south, I just theorized that I could, um, and I made a, a video on this, I just theorized that I could sit out in deep water where everyone's jigging, and uh, look at those hooks on there. Yeah. Triple grips. You know how many fish you would catch if you changed over to them triple grip hooks? <laughs> so Man, I just theorized that I could sit and approach it like I'm on Kentucky Lake or well, somewhere set like. The, set the hook on his hand right now. I was talking. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I just theorized that I could sit over deep water and chuck this crankbait and pull it down the ledge. You know, so I'm sitting in like 25, 26, and I'm landing the bait, what I think is in about eight foot. And it really is only really good when there's no thick weeds around that, you know, the weed line Detroit River is like 14 feet down. So as long as it's early and late in the year, what I theorized was I could take this bait and I could sit out from the ledge and cast perpendicular and just start retrieving it. Now I got 10 pound trilene fluorocarbon on there and it allowed the bait to get deep fast. Now the bait I, I had theorized would work and it did was this Bill Norman DD-22 and I've since found other baits that are just as good but you want something that's going to die. Like this bait is just one of the all-time classics on crankbaits. It's DD-22. They use them all over the country especially in the U.S. down south and that but the wall I love this thing. And what I did was I started casting from like 26 foot or so. I'd cast straight in and I'd start working it down. And it would follow down that drop off all the way out to me. And I started catching fish with it. it was like the first day I ever did it, it was unbelievable to me. And the water's in the low 40s. You wouldn't think a fish would chase down a bait like this uh, going perpendicular to the current. Well, what's amazing to me is about two-thirds of the fish I catch are within 10 feet of the boat. So what's happening is um, they're following it up. They're seeing this thing come down in their face and they're following it up to the boat. Now they're going across the current. Now I always talk to about how we think we're good fishermen but this just proves we don't know two percent of what we think we know about fishing. I'm casting across the current in 40 degree water and these fish are coming off the drop and hitting me near the boat on a deep dive and crankbait. Now explain how that is even feasible at that time of year when sometimes it feels so cold and it's just too early to catch them jigging and it's just uh, that water you think is just too ice cold. They're willing to chase a crankbait in the strong current all the way to the boat and eat it. That's not amazing. just Not just follow and turn away but actually eat it. Now, where, where's your, where's your, like, do you find, you say close to the boat, but do you find that that's where, that's where this changes direction against the right. current? I think or? it's, no, I think it's starting to come up and it's like a muskie trying to tar, you know, get something next to the boat. I think they see this thing starting to rise up and like, if I don't get it now, it's getting away from me. So yeah, that's yeah. when they hit it, you know what I mean? But that's awesome. This bait. <laughs> It will, I'm guessing it gets down on this pound test on a long cast. I'm getting down at least 18 feet with this thing. Nice. And um, I've caught them shallow on shallow running baits. I mean, this is not the only one I use, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's gotten me hooked lately. I'm always inquisitive on new, new ways of catching walleye. And with the walleye numbers that we have in the system right now, you can do crazy stuff that hasn't worked in the past, but now walleye are showing up in bigger numbers in places that you normally wouldn't fish for them. You can get out there and you can try new things like this, this crankbait. Um, but the key is, for me, 10 pound or even eight pound fluorocarbon line, uh, like a seven to seven and a half foot bait cast reel, bait cast outfit, and just cast it perpendicular. And oftentimes, like before them weeds come, you can get this thing, you can cast it up there and get it up uh, shallow and actually feel it bumping the rocks and I've caught them bumping rocks. You, you'd be amazed at how many rocks are up there at seven, eight foot that uh, you don't know they're there once the weeds grow all around them. But some of my best spots are where I'm feeling the rock bottom first and then it pulls off of that and then bunk. But let me tell you, there's nothing like just, just reeling this crankbait thinking that it's not really something that they're going to eat. 
in the spring like that and all of a sudden your rod just goes dead oh. and it's like man there's one on there it is so much fun I, I just can't get enough of it and I've always got these in the boat trying to convince customers who if they're mostly walleye jigging they're, they're not they're not into bait cast outfits but some of my more experienced customers I'll give them this crankbait after a while of jigging I'll say hey chuck this thing out there and, and see what you can get and I've caught it in cloudy conditions I've caught it in sunny conditions it the, the thing is it doesn't work every day that's the thing with it but some days it's awesome you know but do you, do you know when it works like do you, can you can you chow can you say okay today's gonna be the day or no I've caught them in pre-spawn I've caught them in post-spawn I've caught them in the fall I just you just got to get out there and chuck it you know and some days they've just got a little bit of a higher activity level that's the only thing I could think of um, but I've sat in in packs of boats that are jigging sitting where they're jigging and casting in okay. and whacked them now have have the i mean this is something that i've just been seeing uh and hearing about john doing the past couple of years so do you find that john's also a guide so uh do you do you find that uh you're starting to get a little bit more demand and a lot of people wanted to book guides for doing this yeah or? spring and fall this year i had guys that specifically wanted to cast crankbaits awesome and so you know as a guide you must be able to continually open these doors to new opportunities for people you know what I mean um, and back back in the past I actually thought about taking people ice fishing you know but uh, the, the, the previous couple of years when that had happened uh, there was no ice and I ended up fishing down south or something so I just canceled that idea but yeah. having new opportunities for people when you come up like the musky jigging thing that opened all kinds of doors for me um, but casting this crankbait uh, I think it's going to open up a bunch of doors for me going down the road because um, it's fun. I mean, if you're just a traditional bass fisherman and you like throwing with bait cast self fetch and you like throwing crankbaits, I tell you what, they don't think walleye fight a lot, but oh. when, you, when you get them on one of these things, oh man, is it ever fun? You know, and I use, <coughs> I use different sizes too. Like this is a <coughs> excuse me, this is a deep little end from the same company and. Uh, all kinds. I've caught them on little square bills in the shallows. Like some of these fish are up in five, six foot. You know, pre-spawn fish. If it's if it's usually nice and sunny out, they'll be up. They'll be up on top of those ledges before the weeds get thick. And uh, you could catch them crankbaiting. You think, man, the water's like 40 degrees, high 30s. Yeah. There's no way to run that bait down that's moving and skipping along the bottom. But they will eat it. If you're looking for something new, jigging is is getting kind of old to you. You know, give this hand line and a try. Kind of seek out guys like John or some of these old timers and and try that, or or try casting crankbaits. And and you know, there's a whole bunch of ways to to catch walleye around here that uh you know people just get set in their ways. Like right, you got hand lining, you got jigging, you got night casting, yeah. and you got bottom bouncing, which is a whole other. Episode. And that's becoming big bottom bouncing. Well, we're going to yeah. talk about that too. But outside yeah. of that, outside of that, you know. Whether it's a Bassmaster tournament or a walleye national tournament, oftentimes when guys come to your area, they whip your butt because they're using frame of minds and they're thinking outside the box. They're not yeah. thinking, you know, yeah. they're not thinking like a local. They're thinking about ways that will work. You know what I mean? And a lot of the big tournaments, they're not one how you think they're gonna no, be one, yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? Or in places you think they're gonna be one, you yeah. know? So, so. Well, thanks again, John. Uh, and guys, we love yous. Uh, we're getting a strong subscriber uh, count. You know, that's building quick and uh, getting tons of views and tons of watch time. And uh, yeah, it's going to be fun, man. We're really looking forward to this. Hopefully down the road, we'll have some type of a logo and maybe we'll even make some hats and shirts and stuff like that eh? but yeah, that's the plan our, our plan is to get some interesting people on the show and there's going to be weeks where we don't this have week and, and, and we're going to talk there's so many things that we can talk about around here and uh yeah it's uh that's what it's all about so we love you thanks for watching and the grateful anglers are out yeah cheers to coffee and one last story what's that I, 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 you want one yeah, last story? Well, we could, yeah. Oh, I'm joking. All right, let's start that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, Big John, I, I see I you. I shorten that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
You could put some laughs on there. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I got to tell you a story, Ben, you know, I, I Before I forget, one day I was uh, I was a kid, and we moved to another part of town, and my parents built a new house, and uh, I see all this wood laying in the neighborhood from all the new builds going up. And I said, I said to my buddy who lived back in LaSalle, I said, man, I said, we can, I can build us a hut, an ice fishing hut. I got all this wood laying all over. So I, I started, I'd never done this in my life, so I started building this uh, ice fishing hut out of like two by sixes and whatever, triangle shaped pieces of wood, whatever I could find in the neighborhood. And I built this thing in a garage over months and came winter, my dad's like, I want to park in a garage. We never had a garage before. He's like, get this thing out of the garage. So I called up my buddy and uh, I said, hey, you got to get, you, we got to get this thing over to your house because he lived on a canal. We got to get this thing over to your house. My dad's flipping out. So they show up with his brother and it's like 20 below. Him and his brother show up and they got this like S10 pickup truck or something small, you know? And, uh, I go to move this hut, I realize this thing's like 300 pounds. Like you can't, like it's not safe on the ice. Like this thing is so heavy. There's like two pounds of nails in this thing. We load this thing up on, on the S10 and he gets, he gets taken off and I couldn't go. It was just him and his brother who had no interest in it at all. And uh, they get out on the expressway. Well, it happened to be windy oh. that day. And if you know the area, it was right around L'Esperance and EC Road. They're going down the expressway, and there's a cop, uh, police officer following them. And this thing blows out, <laughs> blows out of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> this thing blows out of the truck onto the expressway and explodes into a million pieces. No. Oh man, nails everywhere, <laughs> wood everywhere. It's like 20 below. They're not dressed properly, and, and the police officer made them pull over and. Uh, pick it all up unbelievable oh, it really? was yeah. my only oh man and yeah. so i was afraid to go to their house for like six months because i thought his brother his brother was going to kill me he's basically said don't come here my brother's going to kill you if you come here uh -huh. but uh that was my one story of building the hut we never even sat in it that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys want to learn anything about this this technique of hand lining or uh pick up some big crankbaits or rapellas or spoons come on down to bondi's fishing shop 3796 County Road 17, and maybe if you're lucky, Big John will be here when you show up. <laughs> yeah, not too often, guys. This uh, I I try to come down uh, once in a while and see Johnny, but I, I do drive transport truck, and uh, yeah, it's 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 always great. Uh, coming. We want you to always support the other local tackle yeah. shops too. You know, Strictly Fishing, Sam's Pets. You know, support all of them. We appreciate that. And if you guys are looking for any uh, repairs or you're looking for handline reels. Uh, Chuck at Strictly Fish, and he uh, he's the master when it comes to these. Uh, you could definitely go down there and, and talk to him, and um, and he'd be a great guy to actually have on the show sometime because uh, he he knows the history of handline reels like you wouldn't believe. So that's a whole other show in itself. Truly love you guys, uh, whether you're Canadian, American, Brazilian, or wherever you're from. Uh, we, outer space. Outer space. We really appreciate you watching, and we we do love you all. And uh, be careful out there. Um, spud your way out on the ice. We don't want we don't want to give anybody false judgment when it comes to ice fishing. So uh, be be smart about it, and go with an adult, and and make sure that it's good to go.